Dr. Lynn Calabrese. I'm a professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine and the R.J. Fazenmeyer Chair of Clinical Immunology here at the Cleveland Clinic. This is the green line in which we'll discuss patient perceptions about biosimilars and strategies to address these issues. This is a complex topic and one that is uh, a very dynamic right now. So if we ask what our patients may or may not understand about biosimilars, we have to probe their attitudes, knowledge, issues of finances, access, and then ultimately their inquisitiveness about efficacy and safety. Well, to start out, let's look at some of the cost issues because there is no doubt that when we talk about biosimilars, the most important consideration in the development of biosimilars is the potential for cost savings. This is looking at top expenditure drugs, and as you can see, these are in the billions with a B. If there were a 30% discount with the top three agents, that could lead to savings of nearly $2.7 billion. So this is not an insignificant amount of money. If we now do some forecasting, uh, and base this now on immuno-oncology, probably one of the most exciting areas of the uh, application of biologics, the expenditure is growing at, at a, a greater than a linear rate, and it's expected that this will grow to $7 billion by 2020. And there is now a robust p uh, pipeline with many, many drugs that may expand this to even a greater degree. If we look at the uh, immuno-oncology again and look at the cost of all oncologic drugs, you can see that up through 2012, 2013, there was uh, quite a bit of stability there. But with the development of checkpoint inhibitor therapy, which was approved in 2011, there has been a spike in total drug expenditures that has been mammoth in degree. So. Um, all of us who are in healthcare know that costs and regulating costs are a high priority. In 2010, the Affordable Care Act was passed, and this had many positive motivations. Uh, and while it's under fire, it has done a lot for us to orient our thinking around uh, affordability of care. The key goal was to improve access to innovative medical therapies and create pathways for biosimilar development. So this was actually placed into the Affordable Care Act, and I think it was an important step. Now, with that background, imagining that we have an increasing pipeline of biosimilars, what do we know about patients? How will they receive this information? How will they process it? And what will their attitudes and beliefs be, and what will be their confidence in this? Well. We're closer to the beginning than the end, but there have been several surveys published. This is one of the largest uh, studies, but note to date, at that time we had virtually no biosimilars, and it showed um, that at that time the awareness was low. So that same study compared patients who were aware or said they were unaware about biosimilars and then asked them, you know, um, what their perceptions and awareness were about safety and efficacy and price. And not, to no one's surprise, uh, the aware people had greater confidence and declarative knowledge in these areas. So with that as a backdrop, we need to be, have the dynamic and ongoing studies of patient knowledge and attitudes uh, moving forward. This is a checklist that I think uh, really summarizes what an informed patient would be wanting to know about. If I had a disease, I'd want to know about the biologic therapies used for a specific disease. If you tell me I'm getting a biosimilar, I'd like to know what it is. I think this totality of evidence, if for some people, may have to be explained to them. Uh, but clearly, they need to know that this is there's no meaningful differences in efficacy and safety, nor the delivery uh, or administration, and this will not affect uh, access to treatment. I will tell you, out of all of these, the most important things that patients want to know, and this is my own experience reflecting back on this, is that how will this affect uh, me through my insurance and my out-of-pocket expenses? And ultimately, it will be important for them to know what type of drugs that they go on. Some additional key points about patient education were is that, uh, recall again, 
This was an implicit and explicit goal of the Affordable Care Act. Secondly, that these biosimilars are highly similar, but not identical, not generic to the reference product. And finally, we need to encourage patients to partner with their providers, including the pharmacist, in making informed decisions and shared decisions about whether the biosimilars will be best for them. So in summary, patient education will require a high degree of shared and informed decision making on behalf of both the providers and the patients themselves. And that includes the physician, advanced practitioner, and the pharmacist, as well as the patient. While the science of biosimilars thus far has yielded no red flags and is clinically reassuring, the paucity of active experience with these agents in the United States has fueled concerns and misinformation at times. There is even greater uncertainty regarding biosimilars in terms of how cost savings will impact all parties, including patients. And finally, ongoing education for all parties is critical to inform decision-making. Thank you.